Thank you. Oh, Mary, Mary, welcome to the natural state. Have you ever been to Arkansas before? I have never. This is well, my first it's, my uh, first visit to Arkansas. Well, we made we got the weather just for you. It's lovely. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I even saw the little rock. You did? You I did, saw, huh? You I saw, saw it, the huh? little rock. I almost tripped yeah. over the little rock. Yeah. And then yeah, really. I said, my God, it's the little rock. There is a little rock. Yes. Yeah. Now, Mary, we keep watering that, and it's growing. You what? We keep watering it. Good. And it's going to grow. Yeah, yeah you're tending yeah, yeah, it well. We're, we're, we're going to become a big rock, right, ladies and gentlemen? Absolutely. Now, Mary, let's let's begin at the, at the at the top here, right? Yes. In the mouth. Yeah. And let's talk about the, the language of flavor. Um, and then you wanted to become a sensory analyst. Is that right? Well, I thought I would give it a try. I stumbled onto a uh, there was a the Mondavi Institute, which is out at UC Davis, had a, on their website a. Uh, a call for tryouts for the olive oil flavor panel. And anyone could try out, you didn't need any experience, so I thought, okay, I'll try out. I mean, a tryout to me is always a wonderful opportunity for humiliation, whether it's cheerleading or olive oil tasting. So, uh, so I went up there and I did, and, but, the, but and what was amazing to me is that, and most of the people in that room were in the olive oil industry, and they had these amazingly educated noses, because most of what, when, when you're, Talking about food and, and the experience of food, something like eighty percent of it is going on in the nose. Mm -hmm. You know, the tongue is just sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and that other interloper, umami, yeah. and everything else <laughs> is, the, is the nose. Uh, and these uh, these folks were able to, you know, to pick out these very subtle differences in in these olive oils. And, and I, there was one that was presented to me that was, in fact, uh, the appropriate descriptors were rancid and fusty. And I was like, you know what? Does anybody have any bread? This is great. I... So, uh, so the email arrived that very night saying, "Hi, Mary. I hope you enjoyed the tryouts. Um, so sorry you didn't make the cut. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Not even sorry. the first cut. Yeah. But uh, anyway, it was uh, it, was it, it was very it was fascinating to me how because a lot of it, a lot of what part of it was just sniffing. Yeah. You were just you were, you were even putting it in your mouth at that point, just uh, uh, trying to uh, to be able to discriminate these different components. And, and people can learn you know, with wine tasting. Yeah. You could buy those kits with the little individual bottles that uh, enable you to learn kind of a language of all the different components. Yeah. So it was interesting. See, the uh, the other thing I didn't know, which was quite interesting, is that we have these uh, these uh, receptors in our gut, and our larynx, and uh, in the upper part of the esophagus. Huh? Yeah, taste. Yeah. yeah, taste recept taste receptors, but they yeah. don't uh, they don't pass along the experience of flavor in the same, which is good. Otherwise, you'd be tasting bile and other kinds of horrible oh. things. So they're 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 kind of identifying things and sending messages back and forth. But yeah, there are there are, there taste, are. taste buds all the way along. And <laughs> aren't you glad we we don't have them all active, right? That's for sure. Now you know. Um, the price of meat is going up. Everybody, you see the price of meat is going up out there. And then you just go, oh my gosh, and pork has a problem. Uh, but this is not the first time we've had this problem, Mary. In fact, uh, you wrote about in uh, World War II uh, that they, uh, they were sending meat to our men and women in foreign campaigns. Yep. And they wanted to change our eating habits in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, sure. There was a campaign because the meat, there was a meat shortage here. All the chops and steaks and all the prime cuts were going to the troops, uh, and there was, of course, all the leftovers, the, the organ meats and the, the specialty meats. Those were all here, uh, and the U.S. government hired anthropologists, including Margaret Mead, to figure out how do you change a country's eating habits, because people associated organ meats, although organ meats are healthier, they're more vitamins and minerals, they're, they're better for you nutritionally, they, are they were at that time associated with the lower class, like this is what peasants, this is what poor people eat, or pets. Now, you, you throw the scraps to your pets, but in fact they're the best parts and often the most flavorful, but culturally people had a lot of resistance, so they, they would have, uh, they'd go to, you know, anthropologists would bring in housewives and have them make pledges, I will serve variety meats, they changed the name, they came up with the euphemism, variety meats, variety meats. And uh, they'd have housewives pl make, take pledges. Pledges were big back around uh, around that time. Like I will feed my family for in my you know my patriotic duty. I will feed the family organ meats twice a week. Uh, there were instructions on how to get your husband to eat organ meats. Like d don't tell him till he's done what it is. <laughs> now you did. You know it's it's kind of interesting. We're we're back to doing that again, aren't we? How many people out there have eaten variety meat? Right? You, you know, like, 
Three well, see, three yeah, now, uh, now it's become high status because of, there's yeah. a trend among high-end restaurants to serve sweet breads. Marrow, even, uh, I've been right. seeing on a lot of menus. Yeah. I had some marrow the other night. Yeah. So now it's become high status, which is and what, they, what the anthropologists found is that one of the best ways is to somehow make it high status. Somebody, in the, like a, a president or a celebrity, um, making publicly eating that or embracing it. Uh, no, Mary, that, I, that is, uh, I, I will say, yeah. who, whom do you have in mind eating uterus? Is there somebody out there who's going to eat uterus? Well, see, that was, the, that was the one, um, the, the exception here, because if, yeah. if, you, if you look at uh, exports from this country, um, lips, brains, hearts, you know, they're going to Mexico, the Philippines, Russia, all around the rest of the world's like, we'll take those, they're good, they're tasty, they're nutritious. The one that I didn't see being exported was the, the reproductive organs, um, which... Uh, with some exceptions, of course, and like the lady uh, at Ball State University, Ball State University <laughs> who has yeah. a marketing plan for pig testicles. Um, yeah. There you go, Ball State University, there we go. This, there we this go. just the kind of little fact that makes my day. <laughs> that was, I read that in the book, it was just wonderful. I just, I just laughed. It was just, uh, now this fellow named Horace Fletcher, we got to talk about Fletcherizing just a yes. little bit here. Yeah, sure. Talk about good old Horace. Yeah, Fletcherizing, uh, Fletcherizing, this was a fad in the early 1900s for extremely thorough chewing. chewing. We're talking hundreds of chews per bite, depending on what you're eating. Uh, and the, uh, Horace Fletcher was not an MD, he was, he, he, but he had uh, friends in high places who were MDs. He, was a, he coined this phrase, nutritional economics, and he had this whole idea that we could feed the poor for half as much money if we just had them chew more thoroughly. They'd get more calories and more nutrients out of the food. So let's just, and he tried, the military was having the troops chew their food more thoroughly so they wouldn't have to feed them as much. And this caught on in high places, in government, in schools, in hospitals, and Fletcher, everyone was Fletcherizing, including, I love this, Franz Kafka was a Fletcherizer, because I picture that, you know, that iconic image of Kafka with the intense eyes, and, the, and now I'm picturing him just chewing, chewing. for All hours. Chewing. Yeah. But anyway, it, it is, and it, is, it makes intuitive sense until you know that uh, the, yeah. the stomach, it, the stomach will take whatever you put in there, you can put a chunk, a whole, you don't even need to chew your beef, just throw the whole chunk in there, and the stomach will, you know, use the enzymes and acids and the muscular contractions, Reduce it to the slur, sort of a slurry liquid. Chyme is the name. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's an insult to the s abilities of the stomach yeah. to assume that you need to chew hundreds of times. Yeah. But anyway, it it, it caught on in a big way. That Fletcherizing. Yeah. We don't do it. You, you may want to try that at home. Maybe it'll save you a little bit of money. Yeah? Well, <laughs> it's it's similar to the the juicing fat. Good. The ju juicing fat is a yeah. is a similar kind of a take on that. Yeah. yeah. Now um, talking about these enzymes and amylase. And I tried this. I was in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, and there's aggressive food out there. We've all eaten it, like spaghetti, and it attacks you. It gets on your on your shirt, and if it gets on a white <laughs> shirt, and you're you're at a meeting, you got this big piece of uh, spaghetti here, and it's stained it on. Now, is it true that if you spit on your shirt, that it's going to take the stain <laughs> away? Well, I believe sal uh, saliva contains amylase, which breaks down yeah. uh -huh. starch, and maybe a little bit of lipase, which breaks down fat, mostly amylase. Anyway, and this I love that the, the digestive tract essentially. Uh, laundry detergent is a digestive tract in a box because the enzymes, when they say enzyme action, this, these enzymes are digestive enzymes. They have the enzymes in you that break down fat, start, starch, and uh, protein. So they put the, I, I, that somebody had the bright idea to put it into a detergent to break down those, because the same, same things you put in your mouth, you drop in your, your lap. So, um, so I think, so, I, for years, have uh, I, my, I don't carry a Tide stain pen, which I probably should, because I dribble a lot, uh, but I just take a little dab of saliva, so I put, so it's a handy pre-soak. It is, you know, I, yeah, it is, I tried it, I mean, I tried that, and what you have to do, people look at you when you spit on your shirt, so you, you have to either go up to the bathroom, or you gotta do it. You have you know, to, yeah, 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 unless it's, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's a little awkward, but. Now, I gotta, I gotta, we've gotta talk about crispy food. You know, uh, and you know everybody. I've told people, you know, the redder the apple, the better. And the golden delicious is, you know, a big app. Uh, it's beautiful red apple. But when you bite it, it's mushy. It's a little, just a little bit. Yeah, mushy. we don't like mush. You know, well, why, why no. do we have to have a yeah. crispy sound? Uh, the, the, well, well, the theory is that 
evolutionary, evolutionarily, uh, things that are crisp, that have crunch, vegetables or fruits that are crispy, they're fresh because the little cells haven't started to break down. And so everything is, you know, you're bursting these little cells open and you get the crisp, the, the, that sound signifies this is food that has a lot of nutrition and is not going to, it's not rotted, it's not going to hurt you. So we have a natural inclination to go for crispy and crunchy. We like that. The snack food industry has capitalized on that by fine tuning it to the point where they can tell you the, the preferred decibel level. Oh the, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, um, Was it ninety to hundred decibels or something like something that? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and it's you know, and the speed of the at which the crack in the chip propagates. It's yeah. the speed of sound. It's a sonic boom in your mouth. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> I love that. So that yeah, that's. And you know, all we remember is snap, crackle, pop, right? Snap, okay. crackle, pop. There we go. We're with with Kellogg there. Now, can the stomach dissolve itself? It dissolves the, everything else. The, Why not? The stomach has some some nifty tricks. It's got the mucus yeah. layer. Yeah. The mucus layer, which is protective, but also the stomach lining. I'm told, and you can verify this. That every three days, we have a new stomach yeah, lining. Yeah, we get a new one. Yeah. Yeah. So every it's got days. some. It's the stomach is a, 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 a has a lot of. Uh, self-protective um, mechanisms. My favorite, mm -hmm. uh, if it's your stomach is getting too full and it's reaching the point where it might rupture, one of the things it can do is called the transient lower esophageal oh, sphincter yeah. relaxation, yeah. AKA the burp. Yeah, the burp. The belching. Yeah, yeah the belch. Transient lower esophageal <laughs> sphincter relaxation. <laughs> and that's well too long. That's fine folks at. So. Um, now, you know, let's move on down a little bit more. Um, frogs and snakes. We always, you know, you always hear about people saying, "Wait, if you, if you, if a frog gets in there, it's going to stay alive, or a snake is going to get in there, it's going to stay alive." Can can they stay alive down there? Well, there, there. If you go back in the medical journals to the early 1900s, even in the uh, 17 and 1800s, there are these cases of stomach snakes and frogs snakes. and slugs. There was a oh, run slugs. on slugs for a while. People coming in. Well, there, what basically was going on? They were interpreting. You know, you feel things moving in there. Things are moving around and gurgling. And if you've got reflux or an ulcer, oh, yeah. uh, if you've got pain. And the, you know, people, they come into the doctor and they go, God, there's a snake in there. And every time I drink whiskey, he hates that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I've got a frog in there and I eat a lot of fat. That drives him crazy. Uh, so, but, so it was a very common. Into the, yeah. And, and the, the, what was amazing was that the articles were presented in a way that, you know, the physicians were kind of like, well, it seems to me, and then and every now and then there'd be somebody who'd like they're on the chamber pot and they saw something squirming. They're like, there it is, it's, come out. it's out, it's come out, and they bring it actually bring it into the physician's yeah. office. Some of the physicians had like a little cabinet of curiosities mm -hmm. of snakes and slugs and things. But some enterprising physicians debunked this. One guy uh, took some someone had brought in a frog, claiming this had been in my stomach, and finally it, you know, it made its way out and. Uh, he took the frog, he dissected it, found partly digested insects in the frog, which suggested that frog is not living in this. Unless you were swallowing yeah. insects to feed the frog in your yeah. stomach, then probably that's not what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Now, I've got to tell you, how many people don't like sushi? Do we have the sushi eaters on here? No. We, those are sorry. Now, look, we're going to talk about sushi. Mary? Yeah. Could you tell us a little now. The sushi yeah, yeah. Is a very ugly thing to eat. You know, I, I can tell you, I'm going to tell you something. I had a pathologist, I think it was Dr. Breslow, when I was a medical student, and we would cut tuna up and we had to look at it in the microscope. That's why I can't eat sushi. Tell us about sushi. Yeah, but they were, little yeah, thing okay. yeah, there's something called the anisocket worm. Oh, okay. It's a little parasite. Mm -hmm. Looks like a little thread. I actually have a keychain with a piece of plexiglass with an actual anisocket worm. I got oh, wait, it. Now, where'd you get that? The Museum of Parasitology in Tokyo. Well, where else? Where else? Yeah, where yeah. else? It's five I didn't know they had a museum. It's a great museum. Apparently, a lot of first dates in Tokyo go <laughs> yeah. to the Museum of Parasitology. Yeah. <laughs> I know they have a great gift shop. They can get sterling silver earrings in the uh -huh. shape of different parasites. Um, That's nice. I, I cheaped out. I got the key ring okay. with, the, with the lucite. With the Anyway, but the anisocket worm, it's my, my keychain is too small to see, but on its head, is what's called a boring tool, like as in oh or bo a, a power tool on its head for uh -huh. drilling through your stomach to Ooh. get, where is it trying to, it's trying to get, the parasite goes in the stomach and it's trying to get somewhere else, I forget where, but anyway, so anisocket worms, but don't worry because all, almost all sushi has been frozen, mm -hmm. so which kills the worms. Do you so ask what, people, do you ask people when you eat it, that, is this frozen thing? No, I just assume just that it, it is and live my life. 
<laughs> I don't care. You don't. Okay. There we go. Uh, they're not fatal. You get you, most people end up. They get into the throat. You cough them up. So it's unpleasant, but not that dangerous. Yeah. Okay. So you're, so you're coughing up your worms from the sushi. It's okay. wor well, I yeah. happen to well, love. That's, that's more so what, just swallow them back down, swallow right? Swallow them back yeah. down. Yeah. Right. Or you take the little yeah. tool off and use it for something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mary, you change the way. Every time I drive past a basketball court, every time I go by a basketball court, I think of you, Mary. Yeah. And you yeah. know, hoops used to mean something to me, uh, but it's different. What, what is hooping? Hooping. Hooping. Well, hooping, yeah. Hooping. Hooping, H -O -O -P. hooping is um, Hoop. it's a practice at, well, at least the Avenal State Prison in California. I don't know if the term is universal, but hooping as in through the hoop, uh, that is um, smuggling via the rectum. If, you, if you're in prison, you're not allowed to have tobacco, cell phones, uh, drugs, obviously, cash. So uh, the rectum, and the, the rectum, this is, the, the rectum is a storage yeah. facility. It's a pocket. It's a place to put sure. something and yeah. leave it for a while to I can, I can finish your conversation yeah. or whatever. <laughs> And that. then you can empty it. So it's nice to have that uh -huh. storage facility. Oh, yeah. And yeah. especially nice if you're yeah. incarcerated and you need to bring something in or out of prison. They also, prisoners <laughs> use um, the rectum for, when they're going into solitary, you're not allowed to have any diversionary well, things. Yeah. It's, it's solitary. You can't yeah. bring in reading materials. And this, this explains, like, you know, there's those journal articles every now and then. It's a collection of things taken from rectums, usually things that were up there for um, recreational, pleasurable, anyway, th th those things. Um, one of them on the list in one of those journals said, magazine spectacles and tobacco pouch. And I remember thinking, who puts that up their ass? Why would yeah, you? Yeah, that's good. And then I realized when I went to Avenal State Prison for the rectum chapter, that in fact, this was a guy going into solitary who was bringing his, his glasses, his magazine, and yeah. his tobacco because he couldn't bring that in otherwise. You know, now in prison, can you rent, uh, if you don't want to use your, your story space, can you rent somebody you think? Yes, you can. can. Um, yes, yeah. the um, at Avenal State Prison, the guy that I, inter I interviewed, a guy yeah. who was uh, quite accomplished, he was uh, serving a life sentence for murder, but he was, he was presented to me as somebody who kind of mastered the art of hooping. Yeah. And he, he said, well, you need to practice a lot. You need to kind of practice learn. Lot, yeah. But he said some of the... Um, the the gay prisoners were solicited by the gangs because they were, he said they didn't really need to, there wasn't an adjustment period, they're kind of used to it. He said, he said, we, we call them vaults. Vaults, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you gotta make a living nowadays, you know. You gotta make a living nowadays, you know, story for somebody. <laughs> but I tell you, I think if you're gonna do that, go slowly, you know, go slowly. I think there's somebody back there wiggling, Mary, I see them wiggling back. <laughs> Well, well the, the line that I liked from the, the guy that I interviewed, I said, you know, I was saying, you know, the, the, the defecatory reflex, you know, there's stretch receptors in the rectum. When you feel it yeah, past yeah. a certain point, right. you have this urge to go. And how yeah. are you able to, to, what, isn't that very uncomfortable? And he said, eh, it finds its place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, the other thing, I, talking about this, is that if you're on a long flight, and the attendant comes in, and they say, hey, you want some water or something? You say, no. Then they come back. And you say no, and yes. come back again, you're going to have a marshal waiting for you, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, the, the other way to use the alimentary canal as a criminal accomplice is to swallow. And if you swallow the materials, there's two, the, the, um, on some of the South American runs from South America to Miami, they were, the flight attendants got to be hep to what was going on. They would single out, they would tell the um, immigration people if there's a, a um, flyer, a passenger, who was not eating any meals. Because when you eat, it, there's that, there's a, um, the gastrocolic reflex, which, yeah, in, uh, in with the new, out with the old. So it triggers things to move along. So they knew that, and they wouldn't eat anything so to, to buy themselves time, because some of these are pretty long flights. Yeah. So uh, if you didn't, if you turned down all the meals, you were marked for thorough inspection. Also, they, uh, customs agents could recognize the smell of um, latex. Oh, when yeah, latex yeah, breaks yeah, down yeah, in the yeah, stomach, yeah. say you've swallowed a, you know, some stuff in a condom, there's a particular smell on the breath. And the Asians would look for that smell as well. So there were a couple ways to um, 
figure out who might be a drug mule. Every time the attendant comes along, and when I'm, I'm flying now, and they go, hey, you want some peanuts? I go, yes. I think yeah. I'm sure. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I'll take a dozen. Please, a dozen. <laughs> so it's one thing to do. Now, there are a lot of people out there, and they're called the one more thing crowd. One more thing. You know, um, you got to go. You really got to go to the bathroom. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go the next time we have a commercial. Man, no, I get the next exit. What, what's all this uh, one more thing crowd? Well, that come this from? was uh, the, the gas, a gastroenterologist was uh, explaining this with um, Mike Jones, a gastroenterologist in uh, out in the East Coast somewhere. I forget where now, but he uh, West Virginia. He coined that phrase, the one more thing crowd, and it's people, uh, people, yeah, who uh, they realize they need to go, but they're like, yeah, I'll do it later, or they don't want to use the bathroom that's not at home. They don't want to use it, so yeah, so they develop a, a practice of instead of letting go with the sphincter, they automatically get a habit of clenching and holding. So then they're, they're, they go to the doctor and they're like, I, you know, every time I go to the bathroom, I'm really constipated. I can't go. And what they have is a paradoxical sphincter contraction. Oh, well, that sounds bad. Isn't it? So uh, yeah. Sphincter. So anyway, have you ever come across that? I guess. Well, yeah, I think so. How many people, do we have any one time, one more time person out there? <laughs> right nobody's going to admit thing. it. Nobody's one admitting it, right? But, yes. uh, yeah. Anyway, so, so the takeaway is when you got to go, go. <laughs> yeah, just get because, up there. Because constipation is a, it's a kind of a vicious cycle. The longer it's in there, the drier yeah. it gets, the drier it gets, the more it hurts to come out, and the more, so, just particularly with kids. Yeah, yeah. And then, then the less they, they want to deal with it, and the longer they hold it, and the drier it gets, and that's, uh, that's a bad thing. Well, that's right. So, yeah, you know, if you got to go, you got to go. Right? Got to go, go. Got to go now. <laughs> now, you said that the human colon was sort of a scaled down by waste storage tank, right? And there's a lot of gases in there. So I'm going to ask you the question. This is a question, people. We're going to we're going to see about this. Now, women fart. Believe it or not, they do. You do fart, women. You do fart. I know that. I'm a doctor. I know these things. Um, and men fart. And women know we fart, right? We fart a lot. Who has the stinkiest? Men or women? Yeah, okay. Somewhere, someone states in okay. some reputable journal that uh, uh -huh. women tend to be, on average, smellier. There we go. I knew it. Okay. But I, I know I've had this I debate for years. No, I don't, I don't. Want, well, but men make up for it with greater volume. <laughs> so, uh. But the thing is, that it depends <laughs> on. The, the odor depends entirely on what you're putting in. You know, if, yeah. you're, if you eat a lot of meat, if you eat a lot yeah. of cruciferous vegetables, yeah. cabbage, kale, those are your odor. So it depends on what you eat. It depends on the, what the woman or the man has been eating. Yeah. But for the record. Women yeah, for the record. For the record. Yeah, somebody claims somewhere. Yes. That's, that's all right, yes. Now but I should also say, okay, the, uh, okay. okay. Uh, Michael Levitt, who's published 34 papers oh, on yes. human intestinal flatus, Michael yes. Levitt, if you look him up, he's like the gas man, right? He's he, the gas man. He, yeah. He's an ass man, yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> he, uh, if you look him up on Google Images, his about four or five pictures of him come up, and then there's an image of a can of baked beans. <laughs> 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 Michael Levitt, yeah. Um, he's, but he did say, you know, in all the years that I've been associated with human flatulence, and I go to cocktail parties, uh, Never once has a man come up to me complaining about his wife's flatus. It is always the wife coming up and complaining about the husband. That's flatus. interesting. I'm wondering why that's that's always it. well because we you know we're I can remember there was a monograph written by Benjamin Frank. It was called Fart Proudly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I think we guys you know we we admire Benjamin Frank, so we just smart proudly. I mean we do. That's, that's the thing. Yes, and because of that, uh, some yeah. of the some of the there's uh, different ways to measure. Flatus, one of well, them yeah, yeah. being the flatographic recording technique, which was developed by Michael. Tell, no, no, tell me how you record the, the right, Well, it's not actually a tape recording, sadly, because yeah. okay. I would have liked to, yeah. there'd be probably an archive of the MP3s. But, <laughs> but the flatographic recording technique, it's just a piece of paper and a pen, and when you fart, you make a hash mark. Okay? That's the flatograph. So when they're looking at how, how flatulent people are, but if you're uh, if you're the kind of dainty person who holds it in and like same volume of gas, if you let it go in 15 little squeakers versus <laughs> the guy who lets it all out in one basso profundo gale, oh, yeah, yeah. okay, that person will appear to be through the flatographic recording technique mm. a score of one versus a score of 15. So it's not a it's not a particularly accurate system. I see that. Yeah. I feel. Now Dutch oven. What? 
A Dutch oven. <laughs> a Dutch oven, yes. How, how, you know, there, and look, if people know what Dutch, how many people don't know what a Dutch oven is, right? We know the Dutch oven. It's, you know, when you fart in bed and then you take the cover and you pull it up over the head of your <laughs> and the person. Now, how come you're going to get sick? Methane's a bad gas, right? No, it's hi yeah, hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide, that's a bad in, in gas. In right? concentrations yeah. of a yeah. thousand parts per million yeah. is lethal. And hydrogen, <laughs> and I was curious because, so, you know, it's in winter when it's cold and it's Brussels sprout season. Oh, yeah. And yeah, my yeah. husband, you know, is, yeah. Well, yeah, and I pulled the covers over my head. I wondered, am I at risk yeah. medically? And, but in fact, the concept, I was assured that the concentration would be nowhere near um, a thousand parts per million. The average, to, to, to two parts per million, you can smell hydrogen and sulfide. It's very, methane and hydrogen have no smell, but the hydrogen sulfide, tiny percentage yeah. of human gas, uh, but very, very easy for us to detect. Now, not all of us uh, produce methane, right? That's correct. I'm, yeah. per, I'm told a third. About a third, yeah. Yeah, it's, and methane is... The gas in a pilot light, it burns blue. So, yeah. And I looked on YouTube thinking, <laughs> surely there's some proof for this urban myth that those who produce methane can light oh, a yeah. human pilot light, essentially. But I didn't, I don't, I didn't find this on YouTube. So hmm. if you, if anybody's, has anybody ever actually seen? You've seen it. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen. We've seen it. Yes. And that was this a self-produced pilot oh, light yeah. or this someone, someone else? And it burned blue. It did. It did. All right. Yeah. I've seen Thank it very you. <laughs> I saw it as a freshman in the dorm. Yeah. This fellow named was Joe, and he was he was a very productive fellow. Yeah. And he'd been over lit it, and uh, we had to take him to the infirmary. He walked funny for weeks. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it blue, though? I can't remember. He was yelling too much. <laughs> <laughs> now, i got to talk about floaters and sinkers a little bit, because we get, the, you know, we've tried to look this up, and, and people say, well, a floater is better for you. If you have a floater, that's healthy. No, 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 you gotta have a sinker, that's how it is. But floaters and sinkers. According are, to Michael yeah. Levitt, he of the yeah, 34 yeah. papers on human intestinal flatus, he claimed in the New England Journal of Medicine, I believe it go. was, uh, that uh, what was causing the, um, making the difference between floating and sinking was not fiber, but meth or trapped methane. Methane. That's what, he, that's what he said. That's what he said. So there you go. So there you go. If you're a floater or a sinker, it's okay. You know, it's a methane. Right? <laughs> Now, the other thing, um, this auto-intoxication theory that came up, and it came up, it's very interesting because there was a guy that wrote a book named Walter Alvarez. Remember Walter Alvarez? And, and I came across Walter Alvarez because he was also a physician of John F. Kennedy, when Kennedy went to the... Oh, I didn't know that. And um, so, yeah, he gets around a little bit. But this whole thing about auto-intoxication, what's it all about? Oh, well, it's auto-intoxication, it's a very intuitive uh, belief that... Um, because human waste is unpleasant and smelly and, and full of bacteria that may be harmful, you, we, have, we don't like it, and we assume that the longer it stays in us, the worse it is for our yeah. health. And at a certain point, I mean, if you're backed up, yes, you, that will kill you. But the, and in the early 1900s, people, there were all of these uh, devices for home enemas. There was the Joy Beauty Life Fountain Cascade. Which was a, Can you say that again? That sounded nice. The yeah. Joy Beauty Life Fountain Cascade. Oh, it was a yeah. whoopee cushion, basically, with a novel, nozzle. And you would sit down on the whoopee cushion with the nozzle. Oh, you're going to sit down on a nozzle with the whoopee cushion? Yeah, because you sit down and that your weight would... You know, spray it like a fountain there we go. up your rectum, and it, and it was there was a fad for internal cleansing, internal bathing. Everybody was bathing their insides as well as their outsides in this belief that um, this auto intoxication that, yeah. that you were poisoning yourself with your own waste. Um, and then someone came along and did. There were uh, uh, someone always comes along. Oh yeah. <laughs> someone comes along. Uh, did this amazing experiment where um, he it was. Uh, dogs and they actually closed off the anus. Are they sutured them? Yes, 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 exactly. And then the the idea would be that the blood was then being poisoned because that's how they, they believed that this waste was poisoning your blood. Then he so this poor dog who was uh, had the material building up took some blood from that dog, put in another dog, trying to show that it, is, it isn't in fact the, there's, the blood is not poison. Yeah, right. okay. The other, but the simpler thing to keep in mind is. When someone goes and has a cleanse or an enema, you know, with a colonic irrigation, they go, God, I, I, this is the second it happened, I felt so, I feel so much better. But <laughs> if, in fact, it was blood poisoning, you wouldn't feel instant relief. It would, right. you know, take time to clear from the blood. So it isn't, 
it is anyway, but it was a it's a it's a very intuitive and widely held belief that persists today. Yeah. It is, you know, colonic irrigating. We always hear about uh, you know these these uh, enemas, you know, um, and uh, caffeine enemas. They're still mm. very popular out there. In fact, there's one guy that you wrote in your book, and for twelve dollars and thirty cents, you could you could get the Tyrell's Hygienic Institute uh, internal bathing. Device, right? Yeah, that was the the Joy Beauty Life Cascade. That's the Joy Beauty. Is that the, yeah. yeah, you have to be the the, the uh, every now and then there are people. What? He sold a lot of those. He sold a lot of those. Oh, oh yeah, gosh. he was uh, uh, the the. If you go, to the American Medical Association has a uh, fraud and quackery archive. It has huge yeah. files on uh, Tyrell and his institute and the things he sold. A number of products that uh, made him quite wealthy. Are those still yeah. available? I wonder. <laughs> uh, there are. You could rig one up with a whoopee, whoopee cushion and a some and a kind of a funnel or something. Oh no, no? yeah, exactly. Now the now is the um, is the rectum a one way street the colon? We're talking about the uh, nutrient enema. Since we're down in this part of the body, we might as well talk about it. Um, might as well. Might as well. <laughs> How about President James Garfield, poor guy? Yeah, they um, tried to feed him this way. Didn't well, they? Um, if you if. Uh, President Garfield, there had been an assassination attempt, something, it, he, he was either throwing up or there was a blockage. But anyway, he wasn't able to take nourishment in the normal way, so uh, his doctor, Dr. Bliss, was his name. Dr. Dr. Bliss. Dr. Dr. Bliss, his first name was Dr. Bliss. So, which for him was handy because he wasn't a particularly great doctor, and no, if they strip him of his license, he still Dr. Bliss. Right. <laughs> he will always be Dr. Bliss, with or without an MD. But Dr. Bliss uh, was uh, very enthusiastic about uh, rectal alimentation, which right. is right. putting the food in the other way. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a... Which, you know, for you know, drugs can be, particularly with children, yeah. you can um, yeah. administer drugs through the rectum yeah. and it, it's absorbed quickly. But you're not absorbing, I mean, the small intestine is where all the absorbing right. goes on. Uh, the, so you got to put two way up there to getting good. Huh? You'd have to put it right, but yeah, they weren't. They were just yeah, no. putting it in the rectum, uh, and there were a lot of problems. Some of them just aesthetic. Oh. Yeah, it was. It tended to be uh, egg, beef broth, whiskey. Oh. Uh, so yeah, and and, and uh, uh, Dr. Bliss wrote a, an entire book entitled Rectal Feeding, and there, there were recipes as well. <laughs> well, don't try. The, the only advantage I think that I think you stated was that you don't have to worry about what it tastes like, right? That's right. You can feed them the same thing over and over, and they're not I mean, going <laughs> to complain or not complain about the same things. Yeah, you know, they would just touch. I, I, I found it interesting. Holy water enemas. Yeah. Yeah. This was a this was a case. Uh, there was a, 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 in in France a bunch of uh, convent, and the, oh. the mother superior was believed to be possessed in a right. quite extreme way, and she claimed the devil was inside her. She, they believed the devil was right. actually inside her. And her, uh, I'm not sure who, who it was, came up uh -huh. with a bright idea. Well, instead of sprinkling holy water, uh, he thought, you know, this is a really bad case. We're going to take the holy water in an enema and just get it all the way up inside. So holy water enemas were not widely practiced, but occasionally. Yeah. Uh, and you could see the logic, and so you, why not, if the devil's inside, sure. get it up inside there. Yeah, I, I think so, you know, it changes the way I look at The Exorcist when I see that movie. <laughs> you know, they should have turned to the old, <laughs> the end of it there. Now, here we go. Can constipation kill you? Do you have a term, the obstipation or something like that? The, yeah. the obst obstinate constipation that was yeah, shortened in the 1800s. Can it kill you? You get constipated, can it kill you? Constipation. Uh, it, indirectly, in that you could die of defecation associated sudden death there we go there you go which a is pushing pain. pushing so hard that you set you, you end up with a uh, a okay. fatal heart arrhythmia it's okay. the valsalva pushing sure. vagal vagus nerve you and you know oh, you yeah, can explain sure. it better than i can and did elvis die of this did elvis die elvis of died, it, well elvis had a mega colon uh the, the meg the, i got interested in this because the mutter museum in philadelphia has an example i don't know if anybody have you been to the mutter museum yeah, have you seen the mega colon? I mean, it is bigger around, it's the same size as me, or right? just an enormous, uh, dysfunctional, stretched mm -hmm. out, floppy, useless span of oh, colon yeah, that isn't um, moving material along, and which so it backs up further, stretches more, 
Uh, and the guy uh, whose megacolon is on display there, he died in the water closet, is what it, how it mm -hmm. um, says in the paper, uh, trying, it, it's became very difficult to, to empty your bowels if you have a megacolon. And often there's no nerves along that stretch, it's, right. it's from birth, uh, and I don't know if that was the case with Elvis Presley, but anyway, uh, like the guy in the Mütter Museum who keeled over in the water closet, mm -hmm. Elvis Presley, as everyone knows, died. In his bathroom, right? Yeah, yeah on, on the, the toilet. toilet. And uh, the um, and, and at autopsy had a megacolon, just a greatly expanded, not as big as the one in the Mütter Museum, but greatly um, extended, yeah. distended, and dysfunctional, and impacted yeah. with lots of, mm, yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, Elvis, that was... A so if you're constipated, make sure you do something about it, right? There <laughs> we go. Uh, there's, there's wonderful research going out. Uh, antibiotics are being used more and more, and we're trying to tell people to cut back. Not everything needs an antibiotic to take care of things. And too much use of antibiotics, you can get the, the gut unhappy. And you get something that we call C. diff. And it's very difficult and uh, bug to treat. Yeah. And so now we have a new way to treat it. It's a, it's a transplant. Right. right. Uh, C. diff, yeah, it's a, what was it, 20,000 people a year About that, yeah. die yeah. Of, yeah. of C. diff. And it doesn't, uh, it, it's very hard to treat it with, with antibiotics. I mean, sometimes it doesn't, right. it doesn't respond, and then it comes back over and over. Uh, and it's a terrible, chronic oh, diarrhea, horrible, 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 horrible thing to have. But uh, a bacteria therapy is the tidier name for it. A fecal transplant is yeah, more descriptive. Yeah. And it, it's, it is pretty much what it sounds like. You have a healthy a, a healthy person, you take their microbiome, mm -hmm. their healthy bacteria, uh, and these bacteria become essentially immigrants. You put them in the new land, you, you put them in the person, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and they, within a few days, the, the person's recovering. It's a very inexpensive and effective cure for chronic C. Yeah. diff infection, and it's astounding that it's been around for since the 50s. The first yeah, yeah. was the first uh, attempt, not at, for C. diff or something else, yeah. but it's been around. And, and I asked this physician in Minneapolis, who you know, I went to mm -hmm. observe and to talk to him, and he said, um, "I said it, it is the reason it's taken so long to to catch on is that because of the ick factor." And he said, "Well, there is a natural kind of." revulsion to the notion, but he said, actually, what, what's going on here is that there's not a pharmaceutical company or a device maker here. It's just crap. So it is crap, yeah. Uh, it's good crap. No, it's good nobody crap. stands to you know, make a huge profit, and they're not pushing it. So there's no one to sort of shepherd it through the approval process. You know, the, the hospital does, what do we, what's the billing code for shit? Yeah, I, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, well, that's a little shitty so, code, you know. <laughs> Well, how, how much do we charge? And, you know, when I was there, it was just a guy, it was a winter morning, this guy shows up with his big s snowmobile boots and his coat, and he's got a paper bag, and he hands it to Dr. Kurotz, and he goes, mm, not my best work. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. I mean, within a few days, this guy was was yeah. uh, was cured. I mean, it was, you know, he, he uh, you know, Dr. Kurotz said, yeah, I got an email from him, and he said, you know, Saturday night I had a solid bowel movement. I'm thinking oh, yeah. that's not everybody's idea of an exciting Saturday night, but for this guy, it was miraculous, and it was really it very. I mean, I, yeah. And I think they're they're looking at the for other problems too, irritable yes. bowel syndrome and yes. things like this. So I guess we're going to encourage everybody to become donors, right? Yeah, it's a <laughs> quick and easy way to be a hero, save somebody's life. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, we have time for a few questions here. Mary, that was terrific. Thank you so much, Mary. And I hope you've learned a little bit about your elementary track and what goes in and what comes out. Well, we left, make sure you buy Mary's book. She's going to be, you know, signing books out here. Make sure you stop and talk to her about, you know, the book Gulp. It's an incredible read. I enjoyed it very much. I started and then I, I went from one end to the other, Mary, and I didn't stop. You know, I didn't slow down at all, Mary. Um, now, if there's a microphone here, if somebody would want to come up and ask Mary a question, don't feel shy. She told me she will talk about anything. Yes, ma'am? I'm curious about how you got into science writing. Uh, how I got into science writing, I uh, kind of randomly, I, I was living out in the Bay Area and there was a magazine called Hippocrates that uh, started in, in around the time I was starting to do writing and I the Hippocrates dealt with medicine, the human body, health. It was for a general interest audience, but it was a, just a really wonderful magazine. I ended up as a contributing editor there, wrote for them for about 10 years, 
And then from there, kind of uh, at some point, Discover Magazine contacted me to write. So that was how it happened. It wasn't a, uh, I didn't intend to go in that direction. I don't have a science background. It was one of just those quirks of fate that that's where I went. Yes, sir. I uh, actually have a couple of questions. Um, the first uh, relates to some random Wikipedia research that I was doing one day. And I came across the idea of uh, uh, tobacco smoke in a so yes. We're going back to the a little bit, but oh, thank God! Uh, so, <laughs> this great line in the Wikipedia entry on tobacco smoke enemas, and uh, this guy is walking along the, the waterfront with his wife in London, and she fell and drowned. Pulled her out. Looks like she's dead. And this is the direct quote from the Wikipedia article: "On the advice of a passing sailor, I inserted his pipe." into her rectum and blew hard, <laughs> and she revived. You know, I assume that's because nicotine is a respiratory stimulant, but I mean, do you have any idea why that might be effective? Maybe just shock. You know, um, well, yeah. that's a delightful image, but you know, it's interesting. Um, oh, yeah. Did you say it was along the Thames? Uh, it was along the waterfront. It was on In London? Uh, naval yard. Oh, okay, because along the Thames, there used to be, uh, the, you know, the same way there'd be a life preserver along, there, there were these bellows, and they were, they were for people who had fallen in and drowned, and it was a tobacco bellows, and you would, yeah. you know, put the, little, the narrow end, and then blow tobacco smoke. I, I would imagine, because it's a stimulant, uh, and, and warming someone else, that was another explanation, but that, the, 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 the cat, was hot. Nicotine, yeah. yeah. That I, yeah, I would assume that the, that the nicotine would be the reason. But anyway, I, that, and if you go to the Welcome Collection in London, has a number of these uh, tobacco enema bellows that used to. That, that, yeah, it was a, a not. Yeah. I don't know how common. We don't recommend you blow smoke up your ass. But you know what? Mary's going to have to leave us, I guess, a little bit. But I've got to tell you something, Mary. It's, it's been such a thrill to have you with us. And you've changed the way uh, I, I think about something. When, if somebody calls me, you know, an asshole sometimes. And sometimes that's, I've heard that before. Hey, you're an asshole. Why do you do that, you know? But, you know, when you think about it. It's a compliment. It's a compliment. And tell yes. people why it's a compliment. Okay, yeah. Well, you, you, you imagine, imagine holding in your hands a solid, a liquid, and yeah. a gas. Yeah in your closed hands and then trying to let open, make an opening that lets only the gas escape. You will yeah. fail, yeah. but the anal sphincter will succeed. The go. anal sphincter can do it. So there we go, yep. see? So it's a compliment. It is a compliment. Every part of this is a compliment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Please join Mary outside and she can assign some books for you, okay? And please make sure you continue to enjoy the festival. It's been a great honor being with you. Have a wonderful Saturday. Until next time, Thank goodbye. You, See ya.